Hello and welcome. My name is Michael Greco and my colleague is Jocelyn Lockyer. Uh, we'll just quickly introduce ourselves. Um, my background is a professor in the area of medical education and I've been in the space of researching and supporting clinicians with multi-source feedback over the past 15 years. It's something very passionate about. It's something I find that uh, clinicians really value. And we'll be going through some of the tips uh, um, and Jocelyn, we, uh, she'll tell uh, about herself in a minute. And we'll both be going through some tips about how to support you when you're conducting your debriefing sessions, um, whether in a formal way as a trained coach or whether in an informal way in terms of peer discussion uh, what we call a supporting medical colleague. Uh, over to you, Justin. It's lovely to see you. Justin's all the way from Canada, and I think it's evening there. It's morning here in Australia. Welcome, Justin. Thank you. But it's summer in Calgary st still, so that helps. Yes, I'm a professor emerita at the University of Calgary Coming School of Medicine. I got involved with um, a multi source feedback in the mid 90s and worked with the Physician Achievement uh, Review Program of the Regulatory Authority in my province of Alberta, as well as with the Medical Council of Canada and the National Board of Medical Examiners. Subsequently, I did get involved in the development of the R2C2 model, which we will talk about in a bit. Thanks, Jocelyn. So what is multi-source? feedback. Some people refer to it as 360 degree feedback. Um, others refer to it as MSF. And in Australia, we're now hearing the term multi-source feedback. And I guess generically, it's really about giving clinicians feedback in a, in a, in a structured way that they wouldn't normally get in a sort of structured way. It's around what patients think of your communication skills, and also what clinicians think about you and even non-clinicians about your professionalism. So it's it's that sort of holistic view uh, in a structured way of, of those skills that um, are, we don't usually get. Yeah, we might get feedback on our referral patterns or our, you know, the way um, uh, we undertake various consultations, our diagnostic skills. But usually our communication skills and our professional skills, the way we work within a team, the way we self-reflect, the way we carry ourselves um, as, as doctors is something we don't normally get feedback. So that's what multi-source feedback gives us structured feedback. And as I mentioned earlier, it comprises of, in terms of the structured feedback, three components, patient feedback, and uh, that's conducted by a question. All these are by questionnaires. So what is the patient's experience in my care? How do they see me? Um, it's also colleague feedback. So these are a group of both um, uh, fellow clinicians, um, uh, whether they be medical or non-medical, and also administrative and managerial folk as well. Really the whole care team providing feedback on on how they see you as a professional doctor. And there is a third component that's very important, and that's the, uh, uh, the doctor uh, self-assessing themselves. It's important that they uh, have an opportunity to reflect um, about their performance. So that allows us then to see how is the doctor viewing themselves compared to how others view them. And you might be asking, well, why is all this important? Well, it's very important in the Australian context. The Medical Board of Australia have produced a professional performance framework. And many of you, you will know as, as debriefers, whether formal debriefers, trained coaches or supporting medical colleagues, that, uh, that we are seeing a change in the structural CPD, continuous professional development, that each college now is asking their doctors to undertake 50 hours of CPD per year and that that 
50 hours is not just uh, attending lectures for 50 hours in the year, but it has to be broken down into three areas. And what multi-source feedback does is pick up on two of those areas, which is reviewing performance and measuring outcomes. So they're two of the three domains. The other domain is educational activities. So multi-source feedback will pick up on two of those domains. Specifically, the patient feedback picks up on measuring outcomes, the patient experience element, and colleague feedback picks, picks up on the reviewing performance component. So the Medical Board of Australia's professional performance framework is asking clinicians to better self-reflect. It's changing the structure of CPD and multi-source feedback is a key component uh, within the new agenda going forward from January 2023. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about the R2C2, and I know that sounds like a bad movie or an old movie. Um, it's a coaching and facilitated feedback model. Now, we call it a facilitated model, and we also talk about it in stages, but actually it's an iterative model because sometimes when you um, coach, you get stuck or you need to zing back and rebuild the relationship. So there's four steps. Um, the first step is really making sure you have a comfortable relationship. Next step is about exploring reactions and uh, reflections, confirming content, and then coaching for change and co-creating an action plan. And I'll talk about each of those in um, the next few slides. My colleagues in, well, actually more than Canada, US, uh, there were folks from the Netherlands as well and the United Kingdom um, did a study around, well, 2010, it was a little bit before that, and said, how do people self-assess anyway? And uh, we did focus groups with medical students, with trainees and with licensed physicians that trying to understand how people self-assessed. And what we learned was there was buckets of information that came zinging at doctors all of the time and medical students and, and trainees as well. Some of it was external um, reports that people got, feedback from referral letters. Some of it was just, boy, didn't do well today. I just don't feel very good about it. What we figured out was that the physician, the doctors interpreted the information. In some cases, they reflected on it. Other times, they compared it with other data to see if it was valid. Uh, sometimes they calibrated it or filtered it. Sometimes they assimilated. In the end, they made a decision. And sometimes it was to ignore the data. There was stimuli always. Let's just ignore it. Sometimes it was rejected. Sometimes the, the doctors sought other information to confirm. Uh, and sometimes the doctor accepted the data. But what we found out was there's a context to it um, that also affected responses. The context involved tensions, how I felt about my colleagues. Um, and how I felt working in that environment. But there were also external conditions, including what the climate was, people's emotions, their confidence, and the perceived credibility of the feedback. All of these also affected how people use their feedback. And we did have a component of that study that did involve uh, multi-source feedback. It wasn't, all, it, there were other stimuli as well. So we put our heads together and said, just a second, and this was led by Joan Sargent at Dalhousie University. Goodness, you know, it appears that people don't have a very structured way of helping other doctors, helping um, trainees or medical students understand and use their data. We began to build a model and there was a fair amount of research and theory we drew on. 
One is, of course, the self-assessment work that I described. Other is the person-centered approaches. And for those of you who are in practice and have been doing motivational interviewing, motivational approaches, you understand how important it is to be person-centered. But there also are cognitive domains that influence a behavior change. These are things like physician, their doctor's skill, their behavior, um, whether they think they can do it, those types of things also affect the physician. We knew from continuing medical education work that there was a, that if we could get people to commit to making changes, they were more likely to make the changes. And so that's why the fourth stage is around that coaching to get a commitment to change. There's also an aspect out of implementation science, which tells us just how critically important the facilitator is in helping the doctor make sense of their data. Because, you know, multi-source feedback data is simply data. It has to be interpreted and seems to work best when um, there is a coach or a, a um, supportive person who can help make help the doctor make sense of it. So the R2C2 model is designed to help the doctor reflect on their performance, uh, assess their work, promote feedback acceptance, facilitate a direction for improvement, and then coach or facilitate to get the change. So lots of research. I think there's half a dozen publications that our research group has done. And then there's other work that's been done elsewhere, including work that Michael was involved in with um, Michael Hooley um, in Australia. And we're quite thrilled that others have picked up on the model. What we've know, found out though, is that the model works across disciplines, works across different levels of training, and different uh, formats. It facilitates feedback, um, but the facilitator has to be attentive to both the content and the process. By content, I mean your job as a coach will be to go through the person's, the physician's data, the doctor's data, help understand the data well enough that you can hold, have a conversation with the doctor, but then be attentive to process things like listening, encouraging, asking open-ended questions. What we've also found is that um, coaching helps to co-create a plan and it moves away from assessment and judgment to development and progress. And in fact, we found in a couple of studies that if you can co-facilitate the action plan, you're more likely to have it implemented than if the doctor alone comes up with a plan or if the coach comes up with a plan it's not as successful. But we also know that it requires documentation um, and that some people will require more direction. And we certainly like to think of this as a very democratic, egalitarian model, but the truth is not all participants will have the same ability to think through their data and come up with an action plan but with a little help, they can get there. So the four stages, and I mentioned them before, but they are build a relationship, explore reaction and reflections, confirm the content, and coach for change and co-create an action plan. So let's look at the first stage, which is about the relationship. Beginning the relationship, you know, it's helpful, important, absolutely critical 
that the um, coach talks about themselves. You know, I've been in practice for X years. I've worked in such and such a setting so that there's a level of trust. Um, talk about how many sessions you've done or how many uh, doctors you've worked with. And then even though you may have a bit of data or understanding about that work setting, it's also useful to ask about it because you may be surprised at the things that the doctor is doing. If it's a resident or a trainee, uh, somebody in training, you might also ask about their program, the current rotations, how well they're doing. And if you're not getting very far, you can also ask them about their experience in preparing for the assessment. But whatever you do, really try to work hard on establishing a relationship at the get-go, but also if you need to come back to it. Then the next stage, you're really trying to get the reactions to and reflections on the report. There'll be many doctors who will never have seen a multi-source feedback report in, in the past or been ex have had that experience. And so what you want to do is to make sure they are feel understood, but also that um, you're respecting them. So start open-ended. What struck you about the report? What were some of your initial reactions? What were the surprises? Did the data you found out, was it aligned with how you thought about yourself? And sometimes you just have to say, well, you know, sometimes we get feedback that just isn't the same way we see ourselves. In the third stage, really your task is to explore the doctor's understanding of the content. What does it mean? What do they think are the priorities? Were there things that didn't make sense or they were unclear about it? Uh, while I discourage you from going through it section by section, there may be occasions where you have to. But the goal here is to really identify um, the things that you can work on to co-create the action plan. Because in coaching, you're really trying to enhance their learning and development, and you're trying to create it in a supportive and encouraging environment. So here in the coaching stage, you're really getting at the plan. So, you want them to identify changes, but you also want them to identify changes that are, we would call smart goals, um, specific, measurable, actionable, timely, certainly goals that they can do that are feasible. And so if somebody says, well, I'm gonna implement a electronic medical record system in the next three months, that's probably where you draw a deep breath and say, well, let's maybe be a little more specific. Or if you have the trainee, and this is a common one, oh, I get feedback that I don't know enough. I'm going to read every morning about all my cases. Well, maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you want them to cherry pick some of the areas that they don't know very much about. Uh, but also to recognize that that might not be as feasible as they think. So it's really identifying the changes they want to work on, starting and doing them sequentially. So what is the first change? How would you go about doing it? What kind of a timeline do you have? And particularly so that you will see results. Get them to talk about the resources they'll need. Resources may be equipment, but it's just as likely to be other physicians, maybe feedback from nurses. Uh, perhaps it's 
feedback from a more senior trainee, um, whoever can whoever can observe and see how they're doing so that they can um, get that feedback. And then you really want them to think about barriers, but also enablers so that they're approaching this as in as practical a way and so that they will see success at the end or in the next stage. So just to reiterate, we are talking about a four-stage four model that includes building the relationship, exploring reactions and reflections, confirming content, and then coaching for change and co-creating an action plan. So now what we're going to look at is going through the actual report and, and using the model that Jocelyn just outlined, the R2C2 model. So as mentioned earlier, the goal of a formal debrief is to encourage the doctor to better self-reflect and come up with a plan uh, in terms of um, the report they received. Because as Jocelyn mentioned, the report is really just data, but how do we make that come to life in a learning context? Uh, the, in, and in terms of the report, it is quite a comprehensive report, uh, 30 pages in length, but don't be too put off by that. It's just some, we've done a lot of work around what clinicians want in a report, and we've tried to cover everything for clinicians. So, you know, if they want to know how the statistics were derived, there's a piece of that at the back of the report. Um, they want to know, you know, more about the percentages and, and percentiles, that's all there too. Um, and this is really the job of the uh, trained coach to um, have a look at that report, be familiar with it, because it's the same format no matter what sort of report, when you receive the report, it is the same format. There's national benchmarking and a key element of the report is reflective exercise and an action plan where the doctor spends some time outside of the formal debrief looking at their report and hopefully when they come to the formal debrief uh, they've got some insights that they wish to discuss. Now there will be times and we'll talk about this later in this presentation where doctors may not have spent some time on their report and we've got some ideas both Jocelyn and I about how to, um, to work with that. Um, so the debriefing part, as mentioned earlier, is really important in terms of getting the most out of the multi-source feedback exercise. Jocelyn mentioned some, some, some good work done by the, uh, the, the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, where they published some work around multi-source feedback. Uh, it was a pilot done using these reports. And one of the things that they found was it was the debriefing process with those uh, doctors that was valued the most. The report was helpful, but it was actually unpacking that report with a trained facilitator or, or a trained coach. Um, you can see on this slide here, it moves from left to right uh, that uh, it just quickly outlines um, that usually 30 feedbacks from patients are required, 12 from colleagues, a report is produced uh, and, and, and sent, and then the debrief, and then there's some sort of self-reflection after the debrief. And that sort of total period of an MS activity is around that three to four months in terms of implementing what was discussed at the formal debrief and seeing whether that's helped um, in terms of the changes that has been co-created with yourselves and the doctor. So providing a formal debrief using the model as Jocelyn's outlined before, those four components, the relational aspect, the initial reactions from the doctor receiving the report, confirming that content of the report and coaching for change. 
it's important, as I said earlier, that the doctor try and review the report prior to the session. But it's important for you, as a as a as a uh, trained coach, to understand what's in the report. And as I said, because the structure of the reports are the same, um, once you've done one or two or three of these, you'll have a good sense of what's in the report. And I would typically uh, just highlight some aspects that I would like to discuss in the report with the doctor. Um, so just have them at hand, but uh, as Jocelyn outlined before, it's really about what the doctor wants to talk about. But if you feel there's some things that doctors missed out on talking about, you, uh, you might want to uh, raise those points. It's also important to mention here that uh, I, what I do as a formal coach is I would email the doctor uh, once I've received the report and just to let them know that I'm, I'm looking forward to that discussion. It's, it's, it's an opp opportunity for us uh, together to, uh, to, to help that doctor understand more about their strengths um, and, I'm, and also about what might they want to focus on in terms of continuous quality improvement. Uh, so that's just a, a gentle, informal email. So some doctors have told me that, um, you know, if I hadn't done that, they were quite worried. It was very formal. They might be in trouble. Uh, so you really want to allay those fears and say this is really an opportunity for them to further reflect in your role as a trained coach is to walk alongside them in that process and just to be a mirror reflecting with them and 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 a listening board, really. Uh, and, and that email prior to, I think, has been very helpful so that when we get to the debrief, we've, we've already had an introduction via email. Um, so, uh, yes, look, there's a lot of uh, theory uh, and evidence around in terms of preparing for a formal debrief. Um, so, you know, people, when they come to the debrief, yeah, there might be some issues that they're going through. So it's important in terms of that first bit, the relational aspect, the relationship, build the relationship, just to say things like, um, so uh, it's a good time to have this discussion. I know we've booked it and we're sitting here and they might say, oh, look, you know, it's not a great time, all things have broken loose here at work. And that might be a time to say, well, look, maybe we reschedule this appointment and we'll talk about that a bit later. That might be something that comes up. But they might say, this is a great time. I'm really looking forward to uh, talking about my report. So it's just important to understand that there is context usually when somebody's in front of you and just to sort of uh, get a sense of that before you start the actual process of debriefing. Unpacking that report, there is a lot, as I said before, this is the structure of the report. There's an introduction, there's some overview of results. If the doctor has done both patient and colleague feedback, which we call a full MSF. In some cases, we've had doctors just do the patient feedback and or the colleague feedback. Um, so it's just to be aware of that. The self-assessment data is important and there is a guide for performance reflection and some supporting documents like how the scores were calculated. Uh, so that report introduction, as you can see there, I won't go into detail. You can read that. You'll have the slides. Just gives you a bit of background about the report that orientates uh, the doctor to the idea of data-informed reflection. This is, I find really helpful as a trained coach, this graphical overview of both patient and colleague feedback. So uh, make sure you get a good understanding of this in terms of, you know, the grey horizontal bars are the range of scores for all candidates. Uh, so this is the benchmarking. The vertical lines are the median scores of all those doctors. The black crosses are the doctor's scores. So you can see on this particular graph, the doctor's done quite well with their patients. Uh, I think in every case, they're above the median of their peers 
for all the questions. And remember, these items are apart from questions one and, and 13. These are behavioural items for patient feedback. So this is the top graph there. Um, you know, things like warmth of greeting, being able to listen, explaining things in a clear manner, reassuring, confidence in your ability. These are being able to express concerns. These are all uh, behavioural aspects. But in this case, the doctor's done really well. They're above the median. When we come to the colleague feedback, you can see there that in this case, we've added an extra white cross. That's the doctor's self-reflection scores. Um, you'll see there, because it's only one rating, they're going to be either uh, um, 0, 25, 50, 75, or 100, because it, you know, that's the that's the scores for a self-assessment. Uh, whereas the black crosses are across, say, 13 or 14 or 12 colleagues. So they're going to be in that range. And, and again, the vertical line is the median. And you can see there that, well, in this case, the range of scores are, are, are somewhat similar to patients. Um, they cover down to the 30%, right up to the 100% in terms of the grey coloured boxes. So... And what I tend to look for here, just as a quick overview, is are there any, like this particular doctor has rated themselves excellent on quite a few of the items, for example, question three, four, five, uh, but they haven't scored above the median. So that may be a concern for them, may not, but it's just interesting that some of their self ratings are, in fact, this particular doctor's got quite a lot of excellence. They think they're quite good or very good. Um, but in most cases, uh, they are below the median scores. So that might be a cause for concern, may not, uh, but that's what I'm seeing as I quickly look at this. And I might just highlight some of the areas where their self-rating is well above how they've um, performed. Now, there might be a very good reason for that. Um, uh, so, as I said, this is only a quick overview just to give you a flavour of what, as we start to look more deeply into the report. And in the patient feedback, the quantitative side, you're given um, mean scores. They've done very well. Um, there's usually a colour code for what the blue means. That means they're, they're well above the 75% percentile. Um, You'll even have a graph where you can see the blue. Most of the items were scored excellent. Um, sometimes there might be an item that hasn't scored as many excellence. That might be one way you want to look at the report. Um, I also, the next graph's quite informative. <clears throat> oh, we have some quality. There is, I'll just duck back there. There is another um, <clears throat> Uh, descriptive graph, uh, table where it looks at the number of poor ratings, fair ratings, good, very good and excellent ratings. If somebody has one or two items ticked where it's poor, that's a cause for concern, I think, with patient feedback um, because patients don't usually do that. Uh, so you, you'll normally find that patient ratings are quite at the higher end of the spectrum um, and that's just what patients do. They uh, and sometimes doctors will say in a debrief, well, look, I've scored um, 85%. That's pretty good. But in the terms of patient feedback, that may not be as good because the median is usually quite high. So I would tend to, in that point, just look at some of their um, uh, scores in terms of their uh, individual breakdowns across the items and just see which ones are performing uh, better than others and to just ask them why do they think that's the case. So the background to all of this data is really a curious approach from the formal uh, coach. It's So tell me, what do you make of that? Um, I mean, in this particular situation, they're all in the 90s. So it's quite a, and we'll talk about what do you do with a, a doctor who gets very good scores and can't see any room for improvement? How do we approach that and we'll talk about that later in the presentation. I often find the comments are very powerful, usually more the colleague comments, but sometimes patient comments too. In this particular 
for this particular doctor out of their 30 patients, they've had six patients make a comment. That's fairly typical. I did have one doctor the other day where uh, over 20 patients made a comment. That's wonderful because there was so much information there for the doctor to look at. Uh, but typically with patients, there's not too many comments. In this particular case, um, they are very positive uh, comments, um, often get these, you know, no improvement, need a great doctor. There is one comment actually around time management. It doesn't say any more than that. So just something about time. Maybe they didn't get enough time. I would say that was the case um, about this particular doctor. And usually I would then look at the scores around time and just see if there was an issue there. Um, but some lovely comments there too. Always there when needed, happy to fit my kids in. Um, you know, uh, so so that that's encouraging. And I would tend to, at this point, ask the doctor, you've done wonderful in this, and I would pick on one or two of the items, for example, um, respect um so you've obviously scored very well on this can you tell me you know dr x what is it about dr x that scores highly in terms of patients feeling they're respected what do you do what behaviors would i see you doing that gets such high scores and sometimes that stumps them they go oh, i don't know i and then i say no i'm i'm curious you've obviously got high scores i want to know what it is about Dr. X that produces those high scores. And then they start, oh, well, this is what I do. And then you start getting into some of the behaviours and you want to reinforce that. Keep doing that. That's great. You know, wonderful. And they, it, it, I find that that part of the coaching goes very well. You know, they start to open up and, yeah, I do do that. This is what I do. I think this works really well. Well, keep doing it because obviously your scores are showing that. And with the colleague feedback, and, you know, this was the table I was talking about. In patient feedback, you have the same table. And I would generally look at those columns. Like, for example, I might look at, look, there's so much to talk about. But remember, this is all in the context of after the person has talked about what's of interest to them. So, um and, and maybe I should sort of reiterate that because um, at the moment I'm really just talking about the report. What I would have done at the start uh, is ask them, so what, what, you know, what reactions, uh, and that's part of the model, because I've really dived into the content at this stage. As a formal coach, you'll want to know about the content. But I would have asked them, and we'll keep revisiting this, uh, you know, what reactions did you have when you received the report? Um, opening up the report, that usually generates a lot of discussion. And now, you know, uh, what what is it that you wanted to talk about? And to really find that out uh, as, uh, and that's what I would go with initially. Uh, and what I'm talking about now, and perhaps I should have prefaced this earlier, is, is you just looking at the report and getting a sense of what that feels like and looks like and have some ideas about things you may want to bring into that discussion. And in this case, so back to this particular graph, excellent ratings. You know, the teaching and training of colleagues, question six, that was the lowest, oh, sorry, it was the ability to say no, it had the lowest excellent ratings. Um, and uh, that might be something you want to talk about. They may have raised it. If they haven't raised it, you may want to circle it. I mean, they've got 10 excellence in punctuality and reliability. Fantastic. Um, so they're obviously doing well in that area. So, again, there's, there's so much you could talk about. Key thing is, what do they want to talk about? If they don't want to talk about much, you've got a lot to talk about together. And, again, I would say... I noticed this in the report. Would that be worth discussing further? And they might go, yes, please. And so what were your thoughts about those scores or that particular comment? Or I noticed throughout all the comments there was a theme of you're so approachable. Tell me more about what makes you so approachable. What do you do 
uh, with your patients or, or, or with your colleagues that makes you so approachable. And you'll see that, uh, you know, either across the uh, quantitative data or it might be the qualitative data. I used the word approachable there just then. Uh, sense of humour. A lot of the doctors will tend to, in my experience, focus on the negative. They will zoom straight in on how they could become more effective and, in a sense, dismiss what was being said about them positively. And I, I like to pull them up on that, um, even if they don't want to talk about it. I think it's important. Uh, that's something uh, just to raise because in any change model, it's really about what do I uh, what do I do well and what do I need to keep doing well, and obviously what don't I do well and need to improve upon as well. So both very important in terms of that uh, that that debrief. So the self assessment data we saw initially on that graphical overview, they were the white crosses. This just gives you the quantitative data. You can see this particular doctor has rated themselves very good or excellent, quite high. I would often see some doctors rate themselves good. They usually don't rate themselves fair. They may on a particular item. You know, they may be a, uh, a trainee and feel that they don't really have management or leadership skills, question 18. So they might rate themselves as fit. And that might be an okay sort of rating. Um, but generally, I see most ratings from good, very good to excellent. Um, and in this particular case, this doctor hasn't scored as well as I think they expected to score. So I think before I met this doctor, I would be expecting a little disappointment on their behalf that they may feel that, that this is not a great report for them. So how you deal with that, and we'll have some tips around that, how do you deal or support a doctor uh, that's that's upset by their results? You know, they may be angry about their results. They may have thought they performed a lot better, and they may say things like, um, I think, the colleagues have got it in for me. I hope they don't say that, but I have had one doctor say that. I think that my colleagues have got it in for me. And we've got some tips about how you might formally, as, as a coach, help them on that journey of um, self-reflection, really. Uh, and I think this is what Jocelyn talked about, the process issues earlier uh, on. You know, uh, so we're talking on... I sort of dwelled straight into the content bit, but there's a lot of process around this as formal coaches. And hopefully as a formal coach, you would have um, had some um, background in, in um, the process issues of um, debriefing, such as, you know, reflective listening, non-judgmental, um, uh, open asking ended questions, those sorts of things are really important. And, you know, to sum, to sum up that process is I, I like to take a curious approach. I'm just curious. I noticed this. Tell me more about that. Uh, very important. But it's good to have the data and an understanding of that data. So hopefully what I've been able to do is just give you a little bit of um, uh, background to some of the uh, uh, numbers in the report. And obviously the comments are quite self-explanatory. There is also on the report a guidance for reflection, particularly on the interpersonal skill items. You know, if they, this is a, what we call the ready reckoner. And it's, and, and there's a colleague feedback ready reckoner, just to help them, re, you know, what skills would I need to do if I hadn't did so well with say listening? And you can see there, and there's a brief explanation of the vertical columns uh, in the report uh, in terms of agenda setting, um, empathy. Um, it, it's really just the ready reckoner. I've had some doctors say this was really helpful for them and they'd like to talk about it more in terms of some of those skills. The action plan is quite important. So what you want, folk, then um, uh, as a result is to complete 
the reflective exercise and the action plan uh, after the debrief. It might actually, this might even be before the debrief as well, in terms of when they are going through their report. Uh, so it's important that they, um, that you together, uh, well, they would fill this report in. But I think as a formal coach, you are uh, asking them, mm -hmm. you know, what are the one or two or three things that you might do differently uh, or do more of in terms of what we've discussed today? And as Jocelyn highlighted a bit further, you want to sort of dwell into that. If someone says, I'm just going to become a better communicator, well, how? You know, what will you do? When will you do it? Uh, what would it look like? How would you know if you've been successful or not? So you 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 want to take them through that change for action step by step. But you know you've only got so much time. I, I think I prefaced this presentation with, you know, I normally do sixty minute debriefs. And if someone said to me, a formal case, so what times do you put to that? Well, that varies. But sometimes building the relationship might be five oh. minutes, give or take. Um, exploring their reactions might be five minutes. It might be 10 or 15 minutes. Dwelling into the content might be 20, 30, 30 minutes. But you really want to leave um, at least five to 10 minutes for the, uh, that's my, what I think works for me, or works for them. That my experience, five to ten minutes of that change for action. Now, those action points hopefully would have arisen throughout the discussion. Yeah, I can see that's an issue, and what I'm going to do is do this. Let's move on to the next bit you wanted to talk about, and and to come back to those action points as a formal coach, as a trained coach, and and talk about how you're going to or how the doctor is going to action those points. That's very important to do that um, and yeah that's where you can leave it but later on in the presentation we'll talk about all sorts of scenarios that doctors come up with in terms of either um, resistance to change or you know wanting to do too much uh, we'll, we'll cover those in uh, later on so we keep coming back to the r2c2 model about building those relationships, as I said before, you know, tell them a bit about yourselves, find out about where they practice, what's it like where they practice, who even, I sometimes even ask them as an icebreaker, sometimes it works, um, you know, tell us about the colleagues that comment on you, which colleagues did you choose? Were they a mix of colleagues? Um, were they people that you work with now? Or, you know, maybe they've arrived in a place and they've only been there six months and half of their colleagues are folk they work with in another setting. So that might be worth sort of discussing and building that relationship. Exploring reactions and reflections. What was it like getting the report? Um, you know, was there anything that really stood out for you, surprisingly, either good or not so good? Uh, so you, you really want to, to me, that sets the tone for the formal debrief. Um, and then that confirmed content, as I said, I dwell straight into that, the report, um, and, you know, what's it saying? Uh, and it, it's quite structured, um, but it has the same structure in terms of patient feedback and colleague feedback, in terms of the graphs and the figures uh, and the coaching for change. Uh, you know, you need time for that just to, okay, it's been, you know, wonderful. Thanks for your time. I've been privileged to, to, to hear you share uh, your thoughts about your report and you've got a plan to go forward. Um, great. Uh, so that's usually how we end up the discussion and you get a sense of how well it went when they say, this has been wonderful. Sometimes I get doctors saying, there should be more of this where we get an opportunity to talk about uh, what's it like practicing as a doctor in terms of my communication skills and my professionalism. There's not enough opportunity for this. How wonderful it's been to have this opportunity. I often get that from doctors um, 
And I think the I think the MSF report is something that um, has real value for doctors. And 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 I often see the doctors see this. It's sort of like it's feedback that they don't usually get in a formal and structured way. And I think this sort of feedback generates a discussion that they're not used to, but they like, because it starts talking about them as a person and those insights about them as a reflective practitioner. So it's very powerful as a trained coach uh, and very privileged to have this opportunity to work with the doctors that you'll be working with. So we're going to talk about some of the pearls and tips for providing a multi-source feedback debrief. Just a reminder, we're still dealing with the R2C2 model in which you are building a relationship, exploring reactions and reflections, confirming content, and coaching for change in the co-creation of an action plan. So, one of the most important things is to prepare, not only to prepare the doctor and let them know what the expectations are, both uh, beforehand, however the communication goes, but also for you yourself to prepare before you begin to do coaching. That, re that really requires that you read the report and of course, the first few that you do will be a bit slow, uh, but they get easier and faster because you'll know the data, right? Think about areas that you might discuss and jot these down, right? Because that way you can draw on them as are necessary. The physician may, may well come up with a good slate of uh, topics that the, the doctor wants to talk about, uh, but it's helpful for you to have uh, some things. As Michael mentioned in a previous session, sometimes the, the doctor wants to go to the negative um, and the things that are troubling, but you really need to be able to also talk about the strengths. Did you notice that? You know, is there anything that um, surprised you that was particularly good? When I looked at the report, I noticed this. So you're going to want to draw on those things. So jot down what you see are the strengths. But then also jot down concerns. If you're working uh, with a trainee in particular, you really want to be attentive to issues of patient safety issues of competence. You may spot behaviors, particularly in narrative, not always in the quantitative data, but often in the narrative data that suggest maybe problems with teamwork or collegiality. Sometimes nurses will say things like, I wish the doctor would let us do X or the physician needs to trust the nurses to do why. Uh, those may well come up and you want to be thoughtful about, uh -oh, maybe there's an issue here with how the physician works with others. You also want to be thoughtful about signs of burnout or stress. The last thing you want to do is be aiding and abetting physicians leaving the profession, right? Um, but sometimes doctors get themselves into a bind where they're working far too many hours, seeing too many patients. Uh, and you want to be able to uh, be thoughtful about that. So as you prepare and read the report, jot down your ideas. And then think about the environment. Now, most of these will be done by Zoom, possibly by phone. If you're working with trainees, you may be doing a face-to-face -face depending on your setting. However you're doing it, you really wanna be sure that the person is respected 
and they feel comfortable talking to you and divulging information that they might not tell others about. And that's why one of the reasons why you want to find out as much about the doctor's context and background and work as you can, but also to share some of your own um, experiences. And then uh, Michael said in another um, session, be curious, you know, this is about open-ended questions. Uh, and while you may have a long list of questions you can ask, be judicious. This is not a staccato performance where you zip through a whole series of questions, but, you know, take it, take it slowly, initially, you know, help me understand. Get the doctor to critically reflect on their report, what they saw. And then as you look at the report, think about where the self-assessment score is quite different from the score that the colleague provided. That often will provide information. Look at the narrative. Is there something, are there threats, the threats in that that seem to be coming from other physicians or, or non-MDs. And then be sure as you develop the action plan that it's feasible and actionable. And we talked about having smart goals. Don't forget that you're trying to get their perspective um, and you're trying to support them in um, self-assessment in a guided way. There may be differences of opinion. The doctor may feel strongly that the assessors, the raters have provided uh, erroneous or incorrect information. And that again is an opportunity to explore why they think uh, the scores they got were the scores that they received. And that may be a helpful way of helping the physician overcome some of the problems. Okay, this uh, session is for doctors who are coaching or are supportive coaches. And um, what our focus will be on what happens when because we all have fears about stuff stalling or having trouble with uh, coaching. So what we're talking about now is the fact that these talking points are just meant to engage the doctor further should things stall. They'll help you move from the reaction and content stages into the coaching for commitment to change. And of course, as a reminder, and you can see the circles and remember this is an iterative model, so you may go back and forth, but you are building the re relationship, exploring reactions and reflections, confirming content and uh, coaching for change and co to co-create an action plan. So always, always think about um, when you get started, Tell the doctor who you are, your credentials, the nature of your work, because you want to establish the role and also find out about the doctor's practice and interests. And that way you can draw on that as you go along. You will have reviewed the reports as well as the doctor having reviewed the reports and you've jotted down some notes and be sure to have them handy because uh, you may want to and probably should draw on the strengths you've noted um, and also have figured out three or four areas that you might identify for development. But sometimes things are funny and we're not going to cover everything between Michael and I, but we'll cover a few of the um, things that we found out. There is a sheet that is on the website and you can draw on that for further cues and clues before you uh, do that uh, coaching. So the first one is 
what happens when the doctor's scores are exemplary? And, you know, everybody is anxious about making, giving feedback to someone who seems to be really quite perfect. But remember, Olympic athletes, golfers, skiers, all get feedback uh, to tweak their practice. And so really push and encourage the physician to identify um, areas for improvement. Now, in some cases, this may mean going a bit beyond the report and the narrative and the numbers and uh, encouraging the physician to think about things that may make the office or the practice more effective and more efficient. Areas like research, extra teaching, new teaching, um, that committee work that the physician might want to engage in to enhance their commitment to medicine and their enjoyment of, of medicine and the practice of medicine. So you know, don't, don't give up and certainly don't think that uh, just because scores are exemplary, there's no need for um, probing and encouraging, aiding and abetting. We've got another one on doctor scores suggesting deficiencies. We're not gonna talk about that as Michael will tell you from his hundreds of, of doctors that he's co coached. Uh, it doesn't come up that often. I know that's um, a concern, but certainly um, one where we've got some ideas on the guide guideline sheet. You want to take this one? Yes, thank you, Jocelyn. And and um, just to reiterate that there are uh, lots of common scenarios that do come up and your notes will be able to describe some of these scenarios that we put together. And just to, Jocelyn, the one about the exemplary, I often, because um, uh, you will get a lot of doctors with good reports, I often ask them to describe what they do in a consultation that, um, generate such good scores. So getting them to think about what they do well and to do more of it and get them to describe that, it's it's often interesting. Um, sometimes you get a bit of silence uh, and they're not quite sure what they do. But then once you can open up that discussion, uh, we start exploring those exemplary scores and what they did well. And in this particular case, which um, it does happen uh, where the doctor wasn't prepared, um, when you ask them what reactions did they have to report you might have a doctor say i actually haven't read the report um, and i think in that case um, uh, you you could suggest uh, that maybe maybe this isn't the best time to discuss um, that might be important for them to have a look at that report and could we reschedule perhaps that meeting so that we can get the most out of the out of the um, hour debrief. Uh, otherwise, I think it would be, uh, my experience is it's been difficult to get value when someone really hasn't uh, picked up the report and had a look at it in the first instance. It's rare, but occasionally physician, there'll be a doctor who wants to focus on the positive without solutions for areas needing re improvement. And again, what you're going to do is have your sheet, sheet, short list of uh, items that the physician um, might address or think about. And you've gone across the data and looked at the narratives. And so you may have to be a bit more directive here. And this is similar to what happens when a physician resists making changes or suggesting a way forward. The uh, When the doctor is angry, upset, that can be um, a little awkward. Uh, and But I think... I think there's a this could be uh, rich for learning actually, and I had a recent example where a doctor uh, was upset um, about their results, uh, not so much the patient feedback but the colleague feedback, and um, I just asked, um, you know, you seem 
disappointed in, 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 in what was being said. And because we built that rapport initially and, uh, you know, we spent some time, you know, me listening to her, uh, the particular um, event came up where she shared with me that she was feeling somewhat bullied in her work environment and not appreciated by one or two people in that particular clinical setting. <clears throat> and uh, it, it, it became an opportunity just for her to vent those feelings. Um, and uh, it made sense too about some of the suggestions that were being put forth. And one of the suggestions that was quite strongly being put forth was be, to become more assertive. She found it very difficult um, to do that given the work environment, but also because of her cultural background. She said in her culture, um, it was seen as somewhat rude to, to be assertive, I guess. That's how she saw it. So we just talked a little bit about what, being assertive might mean in the context of her work environment. And uh, that became a learning point. And I think most of the uh, discussion around the multi-source feedback results, particularly the colleague feedback, because she did have a lot of positives from other colleagues, was how she might be able to tailor her assertiveness in a way that um, uh, was true to herself and she could, at the end of that, and it, it, it was lovely and surprising, she could see a way forward that she was going to put into practice, which capsulated some of the feedback and the qualitative comments about being a bit more forthright and speaking up and not being too softly spoken. Uh, these were things that she wants to do, but just um, wasn't quite sure how. So she, um, uh, you know, I was able to point her in the direction of some, you know, uh, just general assertiveness training. You can Google assertiveness. We just talked briefly about what's the opposite to assertiveness. That was very, very sort of high level conversation, but she had specific things she wanted to do as some actions at the end of that particular debrief. So, so when a doctor is angry or upset, I think um, explore those feelings a bit with them and, and see where that gets you to, because there might be something there that, that um, comes out during that discussion. As I said in a previous uh, session uh, during these presentations, uh, that th these are quite um, uh, debriefing sessions. They're, they're, they're touching on the person themselves, you know, getting feedback on one's interpersonal competencies and one's professionalism is, is very personal. Um, and it touches deeply sometimes. So therefore the conversations can be very rich around purpose and around how that can become better in, in those areas. Thank you, Jocelyn. Now, occasionally um, a discussion will get sidetracked um, and I think you have to weigh that as you go along. Is this a problem? Is this not a problem? Um, as Michael described, the physician who was angry and upset, the R2C2 model is one in which you may have to swing back to making sure the relationship that you have with the doctor is working and so that the doctor can talk about what's going on. Um, and then proceed back to the reaction and content. So it, it is iterative and can go back, backwards and forwards. I mean, you will have told them at the beginning that your goal is to come up with three action plans. Um, and so you do want to stay the course on that, but be flexible if you need to. Ah, uh, yes, this is when nothing is happening very well. And you're thinking, my goodness, now what? Well, I think sometimes you say, well, look, we've done one action plan, we've done two, 
um, our hour is up. I think we need to either come back or leave it at uh, what you've got. Depends on your circumstances as the coach. Okay, in this uh, section on multi-source feedback, we're gonna talk about what you'd actually say when you're debriefing trainee doctors and you end up with a glitch or two or a challenge. And I'd like to preface it by saying that trainees are a bit vulnerable. They may be very vulnerable. And there's always a power differential, particularly if you are their um, su supervisor or are otherwise evaluating them, there may be levels of discomfort that are in place uh, regardless of what you say or do. And so it's important, of course, to set the expectations, but it's also important to recognize that there can be challenges based on gender, ethnicity, the trainee doctor's school of graduation or country of graduation, um, age, many things uh, may contribute to the vulnerability. We're not saying that you shouldn't do coaching. We absolutely think you should do coaching, but to be attentive to some of those vulnerabilities, particularly if things seem to stall or the uh, trainee isn't particularly a forthcoming. So when you're working with a trainee doctor, and we're just providing some points that will um, engage the trainee if the conversation stalls, and they help, help you move into the reaction and content stages. And of course, you um, do remember that the model is based on the relationship exploring reactions and reflections, confirming content, and then coaching for change so that you can co-create an action plan. When uh, you're working with the trainee and trying to establish that relationship, and you may already have a relationship, but what you want to do is make sure that you set the agenda for the session and that you know, to make sure that everybody's comfortable, ask about current and past experiences, or ask how the current rotation is going, how the work experience is going right now. I think it's important um, because you will have reviewed the report prior to sitting down with the trainee, make sure you've noted the strengths uh, on the report because while you want the person to improve, it's also you know, critically important to reinforce what the trainee is doing well. And then once you and the trainee have determined your three areas for development, you want to proceed with coaching so that you can get a commitment um, and help the trainee be as specific as possible. What will they actually do? How will they do it? What's going to enable their success? What might present barriers for their success? And then have a timing, timing in place and a follow-up plan. Now, it may not be you doing the follow-up. It may be asking the trainee to identify the supervisor on the next rotation who can give them feedback on their progress. But there should be um, there should be follow-up or a mechanism for follow-up. So the first uh, what would you do if or what would you say if is you have a lot of data and it needs pri it needs to be prioritized. And sometimes that is just the way these reports go. There's a lot of narrative. Sometimes they conflict. Um, sometimes um, there's so many ideas that you could have for action plans, and you can't do it all. Really give some thought to, are there issues of patient safety 
that you're concerned about with the training. If there are, that would be an area that you'd really want to make sure that somewhere in the action plans uh, you um, begin to address that. But you might also have concerns about professionalism, um, communication skills. Make sure that um, you identify what you think are the most important and so that the discussion can focus on them. Because there's no way a resident and a trainee can leave a session like this with a short, with a long list of 12 things that they can improve. Three is about all we can handle. And, you know, be, ask open ended questions. When I read the report, I thought about or I noticed that. What, what are your thoughts about this? So there's certainly ways to get at it in a, in a gentle but effective, and sometimes you have to be more directive than not. I think, thanks, Jocelyn. The, um, the, there may be occasions when the trainee is not prepared for the discussion. Now, you would expect that in a training environment, the message around multi-source feedback would have been communicated in a way that says when you receive your report, um, please spend some time looking at your report, using the um, reflective guide in the report to, to, um, to further understand your results and that the trainee would have prepared for the discussion um, uh, with the uh, trained coach or the supporting medical colleague or the GP supervisor or the medical educator. So you, you'd expect that would be, um, that this may not happen, but occasionally it does. And if it does, and the trainee, for example, um, hasn't had time to review the report, it might be worth rescheduling that appointment to ensure that there's value in the debrief with the trainee. Um, I mean, you may want to ask, you know, what got in the way of not being able to debrief your report. Um, I wouldn't focus on that too much, but it's more about we need, we, we, you know, we'd like to, to get value. I, you know, I want to support you in understanding these results. We need to give it the dedicated time uh, and you need to uh, uh, give it the time to reflect on these results because they're quite quite um, valuable results in the sense that they uh, provide a lot of insights. It's not just, you know, for example, one person providing insight. It's, um, it's 40, 42 or more people providing insight, 30 patients at least, and at least 12 colleagues. So rich information that the trainee can draw on. And if they haven't had that time, to reflect on that report, I think you might be better rescheduling uh, the appointment for the debrief. It's rare, but occasionally you get a trainee who wants to focus on the positive without coming up with solutions for areas that need improvement. I think this comes up most often when you uh, have a trainee who's afraid of losing face or a very vulnerable trainee who doesn't um, isn't able to reflect, uh, perhaps trained in a different setting where the uh, doctor always knows the answer, um, and it's hard for them to deal with uh, recommendations and suggestions uh, for improvement. There are sometimes, um, if you are a physician yourself and, and doing the coaching, you might remind the trainee that um, we're dealing with a growth mindset. We all have areas. If you're comfortable, you can share some of the areas you personally are working on. Um, so to normalize the effort of uh, improving and, and uh, continuously. 
You might also state something like, I see from the report you're doing reasonably well, but we can all grow as doctors and must critically, must keep critically reflecting on how we're doing. Um, but, you know, when I looked at your report, there are a few things I noticed. Well, what are your thoughts about these particular things? And, and then push, push and be a bit more directive about how, first of all, they have to acknowledge this may be an area of interest. We know from the research that co-development seems to lead to more likely implementation, um, but push to get an agreement that that's an area that they'll work on and then work out a plan for how they'll do it and when they think they will be successful and will know they're successful. Now, occasionally we get um, a trainee who is angry and upset, and sometimes you just have to work through that and figure out why they're angry and upset. And it may be related to some of the power differential. It may be related to something that went on that day. Um, and if you can figure out what's going on, then and you feel you can do a successful session, proceed. If you don't, you know, if they've had uh, a patient who's died that day that they were unexpectedly, some family tragedy, you know, you might just want to back off and reschedule the session when it can be a productive session. Yes, occasionally. That, thanks, Jocelyn. Um, doctors may get some negative uh, feedback from non-doctor sources. Now, some reports, the report, uh, depending on the type of multi-source feedback that the doctor receives, some or the trainee receives, some reports have a breakdown of uh, doctor versus non-doctor scores, but the comments I've found that some of the trainees they know may know who's provided that particular comment, and it may be a non-doctor, um, and it may be I haven't come across this too often where they may want to dismiss um, that particular comment because it's a non-doctor, and I would often explore with them. You know, what makes them say that, um, uh, you know, in the, in the framework of we can all, we can learn from all sorts of people in a care team, uh, that we are team members and everybody within the team is important. So, uh, but I would like, it's, it's more important that that's me giving advice, but I, I want to hear from that trainee what makes them think that the uh, non-doctor source, say it's a nurse or, or a practice manager, it uh, provides feedback to help that trainee do better, what makes them think that's less valuable. And that can be an interesting discussion in itself and open up um, some conversation that um, in a positive way may lead to some things that the trainee sees uh, that they could improve because a lot of the multi-source feedback, um, whilst there's some questions on clinical ability and clinical knowledge in the colleague feedback, most of it is really around the way their manner, the way they operate as a person uh, within a care team and with the patient. So, so these are sort of, uh, in some ways, humanistic skills. Um, uh, uh, not hard clinical skills that um, people will comment on. And that's what the multi-source feedback is picking up. Uh, it's, it's providing a workplace-based assessment that is quite different from other clinical assessments, which are important, obviously, but the multi-source feedback fills a gap uh, within that plethora uh, of assessments for the trainee in a sort of formal structured, validated way, both patient and colleague feedback. 
So um, so hearing from non-doctors is really important. Uh, uh, so you as a debriefer um, will, will, will know that. Um, so if you do get that um, comment from the trainee that, well, it was a just a nurse that said that, then, yeah, I would um, I would explore that further uh, as a debriefer and hopefully there's some learning for that particular trainee. So, yeah, catching an exemplary trainee, where, where, is there such a thing as an exemplary trainee? Um, some might say yes uh, in the context of a trainee. Um, some may say that um, all trainees have areas to improve. Well, we could say that about all of us, couldn't we? So you as a debriefer, you'll know that we're on a journey of lifelong learning. We're all learners. Um, and how do you uh, coach a trainee who's done very well? Well, I think one of the first things is to acknowledge that they've done very well and they hopefully can see that. Hopefully, I, did, I have had one example where they did extremely well, but there was one comment that just took the edge off that off that example, and they and they wanted to focus on that one comment. Now, as a debriefer, your challenge is to acknowledge that uh, yes, there is a comment around something that you're not quite that you're a little bit concerned about. There's also lots of other things, and the rest of the report is quite quite positive. Um, so can we focus on that in the first instance and then come back to that? And they might say, yeah, why not? Yeah, let's have a look at those. I knew I was pretty good in those things. And that's why I would ask the trainee, so tell me a little bit more about what you do to, to get such exemplary results. What would I see you doing? What behaviours would I see you enacting to score high on the way you explain things to patients, for example? What do you do in a consultation? by way of explaining that generates those high scores or where you've scored highly in the way you've respected your colleagues? How do you demonstrate respect in your workplace? What do I see you doing or not doing? So even though they've done very well, uh, I think it's important for the trainee to know why they've done well and how they do that and to keep doing that. So, you know, as a debriefer, you might want to um, focus on uh, continue doing those things. And there may be some areas where you stop doing and there may be some areas where they consider doing. So I think, yeah, it's all in the context of lifelong learning. We can all improve, but we can also all focus, and this I think is the point I've made in earlier presentations, the reflective practitioner is one who looks at what they do, both good and possibly not so good, and tries to change or keep doing what they're doing well and to know what they're doing, that's important. Coaching the trainee with many gaps is about prioritizing what you want to say, uh, recognizing that you can only do so much in any given session, and you need to focus on those gaps that might suggest problems in the workplace, problems with patient safety. Now, occasionally you'll find a trainee who can't believe they have any deficits. They've always been rated nearly perfect on scoring systems. Perhaps this is a North American syndrome from our school system where Little children get gold stars and pats on the back, and they only the brightest and highest achievers get into medical school, and they get five out of five on all of the scoring systems. But occasionally, you'll find a, a trainee who just is in shock that they would get um, feedback that they feel is subjective and and unfair when they've been very nearly perfect their whole life. Again, it's a question of what have you figured out from the report? Um, don't forget their strengths, but also be somewhat directive in identifying areas that they can improve. This is about being in a growth mindset and getting better and reminding them that even Olympic athletes 
who are the cream of the cream uh, have coaches and trainers and advisors, or they're not going to get that gold medal. And, uh, you know, I, I think that um, most most trainees will, will respond um, if you have a, an honest um, and fair discussion with them. So that really brings us to the end of our challenges, I guess, um, considerations if you are working with trainee physicians and uh, lots of resources are available to you. And um, we hope that you will avail yourself of them. There is a guideline sheet which uh, covers many of the same um, dilemmas that we've talked about today. Thanks, Jocelyn, and uh, we wish you well in whether you're a trained coach in uh, multi-source feedback debriefing or a supporting medical colleague, uh, trusted peer. Uh, hopefully these resources uh, that um, have been provided to you are helpful in that process. Thank you.